Hello Anatomy and Physiology Lab Geeks. Welcome to your Developmental Biology Laboratory. In this laboratory, we're going to go through the anatomical changes that happen during human development, starting with a fertilized egg or zygote, going through the embryonic period, and then ending up here in the fetal period. And so it's going to be about a 280 day journey, and a lot of that time we're going to spend in the embryonic period because that's when the most profound changes occur. Okay, first we're going to start out and talk about the process of embryogenesis. Embryogenesis is the process where we take a secondary oocyte, which you can see up top, and eventually end up with something like a 28 day embryo, like you can see down here on bottom right. So let's go through those steps. First of all, up top, number one is our secondary oocyte. It was ovulated from our ovary under the direction of luteinizing hormone, and it is surrounded by a ring of cells which is called the corona radiata. These are just remaining granulosa cells. Now, where this is going is it's moving up the fallopian tube, uh, and it's being propelled by those little cilia that line the fallopian tube, and ideally, about a third of the way down that fallopian tube, it meets up with a spermatozoa. And this is where the process of fertilization occurs. Now, once fertilization occurs, uh, that egg becomes fertilized and then it becomes a zygote. The zygote is a single cell fertilized egg and it then undergoes a process called cleavage. Cleavage is a type of cell division that is mitotic, but it divides the cells into smaller and smaller parts because the cells don't grow in between divisions. So up here you can see probably a four or an eight cell stage embryo. And down here you can see a little bit further along something that's called a morula. A morula is a solid ball of cells and both of these structures are surrounded by a zona pellucida. The zona pellucida is simply the shell around this developing egg or embryo. Eventually we're going to become a very complex structure called a blastocyst. A blastocyst is a solid or sorry, hollow ball of cells. Solid, or sorry, hollow ball of cells that has some unique features like an embryonic disc in there. It also has an amniotic cavity, etc. Now eventually this blastocyst will go through more changes like gastrulation, neurulation to become this very complex structure that's already embedded on the side of the uterine lining like we can see down here and that's where the embryo will continue to grow until it gets to be something like this. At that point we'll enter the fetal period. Now before we go fetal let's go a little bit more detail on the process of embryogenesis starting with fertilization. Okay, let's just do an overview of fertilization based on what we've talked on so far. So this process is number eight, fertilization. Now let's take a look at what we had there. Number nine was our secondary oocyte, which was surrounded by number 10, our corona radiata, which were residual granulosa cells left over from our cumulus oophorus. Number 11 is our spermatozoa, which is fertilizing that egg. And number 12, here you can see the egg with the uh, corona radiata removed. And what you see there is the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida is the shell, and it's there for a couple of reasons. One, it's really important in preventing polyspermy. So once one sperm penetrates the shell, it's gonna kind of ionize itself and prevent other uh, spermatozoa from moving in so we don't have too many chromosomes. Now if we go over to number 13, after that egg is fertilized, it will form the first polar body. Remember that oocytes haven't actually gone through all the steps of meiosis uh, prior to ovulation. We still have a couple more steps to go. So this polar body are residual chromosomes that this uh, oocyte is casting aside before fertilization can take place or before those uh, chromosomes can meet together. So then we have another polar body. So 13 and 14 are polar bodies. And here we have our female and male pronucleus, which contain the male and female DNA, which will eventually combine together to make what we have here, the zygote. Now, once that zygote forms, it will then start to go through the process of cleavage. Cleavage is where we divide that cell into two smaller cells, and this is gonna continue for some time during the embryonic period. So once we have that zygote, we're gonna take a look at the steps of cleavage as it goes from a one cell to a two cell to a four cell, et cetera. So here you can see right here, we're at probably an eight cell stage. Uh, and again, you can see eight different cells on here, and these cells are called blastomeres. Blastomeres are just the embryonic cells that are part of that embryo. Eventually, we're gonna form something called a morula. A morula is a solid ball of cells, which is about 16 cells or more uh, in composition. And that morula is gonna to continue to divide mitotically through cleavage to give us a hollow ball of cells, which is called a blastocyst. Now, this hollow ball of cells is hollow. It has something called a blastocele, which is the hollow cavity right here. It also has something called the inner cell mass. 
The inner cell mass is important because this is what will become the embryo and some of the extra embryonic membranes like the uh, amniotic sac and the yolk sac. And then surrounding that whole thing we have here is something called the trophoblast. The trophoblast is a ring of cells that will eventually become the embryo's portion of the placenta. So tropho means to feed, so literally this trophoblast helps to nurture the embryo as it grows and divides. So now we're going to take a more detailed look at a later stage blastocyst. Remember a blastocyst was a hollow ball of cells. Now this blastocyst here is not actually a human blastocyst, it's actually a frog one, but it's very similar in composition. The only difference is at this stage of development a uh, human blastocyst would no longer have this structure out here which is called the zona pellucida. Remember the zona pellucida was the shell of the egg and because humans are placental mammals uh, this shell is actually going to hatch around day four or five I think and at that point we're going to have that that embryo uh, embedding onto the side of the uterus. Now underneath the zona pellucida we have that ring of cells called the trophoblast. Remember trophy means to feed so the trophoblast is eventually going to go on to become the chorion which is the embryo's portion of the placenta. Now the placenta is an organ of exchange of nutrients but we haven't formed it yet. So other structures we can see up here is we see this embryonic disc right here and the embryonic disc goes on to become that's right the embryo and it has two parts the epiblast up top and the hypoblast, hypoblast down below. Now above the epiblast we can see a sac called the amnion or amniotic cavity. This will go on to become that kind of water bag that surrounds and protects the developing embryo and later fetus. Below that we can see the developing yolk sac this will go on to become the area, the inside of the gut, and it's an area where we actually will form immature blood cells uh, during the process of development. Okay, now we're taking a look at an actual human blastocyst, which is implanted in the uterine lining, and this is approximately around day 11 of development. So let's take a look at what we can see right here. First of all, you can see that this is the endometrium. This is the uterine lining right here. And then this part right here is called the decidua capsularis. Basically, the uh, blastocyst will connect to the side of the uterus and actually begin to dissolve the uterine lining. And eventually, the uterine lining will form over top, and that is our decidua capsularis right there. Okay, other structures we can see right here. Remember, this used to be called our trophoblast, but it has differentiated into a larger, more developed structure called the syncytiotrophoblast. And this is literally dissolving away endometrial cells and providing nutrition for that developing uh, blastocyst or embryo until we can form a legitimate placental connection. Other structures we have in here, so remember this was our epiblast, which was part of our embryonic disc, and below that was our hypoblast. And this area in here, this hollow area, is actually probably best called the archenteron, which will become part of the primitive gut. Okay, here we are a few days later in development, and we're around day 14, and the big difference is here you can see the embryo, number 40, is surrounded by a very conspicuous extra embryonic coelom. A coelom is just a cavity. The other thing what I want you to notice is we have a developing umbilical cord right here going to the chorion, and the chorion has these little extensions called chorionic villi. The chorionic villi are embryonic in origin, and they are there to absorb nutrients from the mother's tissues and circulation. The embryonic, the chorionic villi are going to become the embryo's component uh, or contribution to the placenta as it develops. The other structures we have up here is we have a very well developed endometrial gland. Okay, the next process which is really important is something called gastrulation and it happens eh, right around day 16 or so and we don't have a very good model of it in the lab so we have a drawing right here that I pulled off the internet. So remember that embryonic disc, it had two layers. It had a top part called the epiblast and a bottom part called the hypoblast. Now the epiblast is gonna go on to become ectoderm and the hypoblast is gonna go on to become endoderm. And what happens during uh, gastrulation is we form a third layer in between called mesoderm. And mesoderm is a third embryonic tissue type which is very important because it forms connective tissues, muscles, and bones. Okay, so we've just gone through that process called gastrulation where we created the three tissue types, endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. Let's take a look at what happens in the next developmental stages. So starting on the left-hand side, you can see an embryo that has ectoderm labeled here. So ectoderm is actually divided into two parts, the epiderm, which will form the surface of the skin, and something called neural plate. 
So neural plate and epiderm are both derived from ectoderm. So what this means is the same tissue that goes on to make up the surface of your skin will actually make up your brain and spinal cord. How freaking cool is that? Okay, next what I wanna point out here is you can see this red tissue right here was our mesoderm. This mesoderm, again, will go on to become muscle tissue and connective tissues like bone. And what we can see right here in the middle is our notochord. Now the notochord was derived from the mesoderm and it's basically comprising a rudimentary spine that helps to give support to the embryo until we can form a legitimate uh, spine or vertebral column. Now down below we can see the endoderm. Remember the endoderm here will form the lining of the GI organs. And this cavity right here is probably best termed the archenteron. Now moving over to the middle diagram what we have. So this is another embryo a little bit later in development. Up top we can see that we have neural plate there. And then on the sides we can see our mesoderm. What we notice now is the mesoderm now has a cavity in it. And that cavity is called the coelom. And this coelom helps divide this mesoderm into two different regions. We have somatic mesoderm and splanchnic mesoderm. Somatic mesoderm goes on to form the connective tissues underneath the surface of the skin. You know, so we find that in the skin and also in the limbs and things like that. And then the splanchnic mesoderm goes on to form the mesoderm that is underneath the endothelium and the GI organs. Now, all the way at right, what we can see is a little bit further along, we still have that embryo. And what we can see now is that neural plate is forming into something called a neural fold or nor neural groove. And this is gonna form a taco-like structure, which will eventually go on to form a tube through the process of neuralation. So let's take a look at that now. So we didn't have a very good diagram of neuralation in the lab, so I stole this off the internet. So what you can see here is we start out with a neural plate and under uh, signals from the notochord, that neural plate will become a neural fold. That neural fold will continue to fold up and eventually it will form something called a neural tube. Now the neural tube is the basis for the CNS organs, the brain and the spinal cord. Think about those organs. They have hollow parts and they also have solid parts. In the brain, the hollow parts were the ventricles and in the spinal cord, the hollow part was that central canal. Now this process of neurulation is actually a very, very delicate process and it requires a lot of folic acid. And this is the reason why we encourage women of childbearing years to get enough folic acid in their diet. Because this process happens very early on in development. A lot of times women may not even know they're pregnant yet. So it's a good preemptive measure to take folic acid to encourage proper neural tube formation. Now, if this goes awry, we can have some very bad abnormalities like spinal bifida or even anencephaly. Okay, so this shows an embryo at about halfway through the embryonic period of approximately 28 days. So let's take a look at the structures we can see here. So up top, we can see this was the embryo's portion of the placenta. These are probably the chorionic villi. Up here, we have the yolk sac. And then down below, this was the amniotic cavity. And the amniotic cavity has, of course, the embryo on it. The embryo looks like a space alien. So what can we see here? Well, the embryo has kind of a head region up here. So we'll call that the head. And then here we can see an optic vesicle, which will form the eye, and also an olfactory pit, which will eventually form the nostrils or nose. Okay, underneath that we have something called the maxillary uh, process, and that will go on to become the top part of the jaw. Underneath that we have the mandibular arch, that will become the bottom jaw. And underneath that we have the hyoid arch, so that will become the hyoid bone. So these right here are actually called branchial arches or pharyngeal arches, and that means branchial means gills. So in uh, lower vertebrates like fish, these actually go on to become gills, but in humans, they go on to become the upper and lower jaw as well as the hyoid bone. Now, underneath that, you can see something called the cervical sinus, and just below that, you see this area right here, which is probably the heart. The heart is sort of outside the body right now, which is pretty freaking cool. What else can we see? Well, we see these little segments right here. These segments are called somites. Somites are literally body segments and they comprise three different parts. The outside is called a dermatotome or a dermatome. And then below that would be something called a myotome or a muscle segment. And deep to that would be something called a sclerotome or bone segment. So these are the body segments right here called somites. Right here we can see, this is probably a limb bud. This is gonna be probably an arm bud. Whereas back here we have a leg bud that will go on to become the leg. And of course we have this beautiful post anal tail right there, which hopefully we're not gonna be born with. That's gonna go away before we end our fetal period. And last but not least, I just wanna point out, this is our umbilical cord that is uniting us to our developing placenta.
Okay, now let's take a look at that embryo about four weeks later towards the end of the embryonic period. So how is it different? First of all, it doesn't really look like an embryo anymore. It doesn't look like a space alien. It looks kind of like a baby. In that case, we're probably going to call it a fetus rather than an embryo. What we can see out here is it's surrounded by this nice amniotic sac, which is that bag of waters that's surrounding and protecting the baby. And we can see the very well-developed umbilical cord, which is uniting us to the placenta. And then we can see the yolk sac up here. Here's our yolk sac. And then we can see this very well-developed chorion, which is the embryo's portion of the placenta, and these chorionic villi, which are exchanging nutrients with the, uh, the maternal parts of the placenta. Okay, now we can take a look at the fetal period. We're actually not gonna spend hardly any time in the fetal period because we've already laid down the basic body plan during the embryonic period. What's gonna happen now in the fetal period is simply growth and development of these organs and organ systems. So, some structures we didn't see before. First of all, this structure right here is called the decidua capsularis. We saw it several slides ago where it was like a little bitty scab that formed over that blastocyst. But what it is now is it's the part of the maternal reproductive tract that is covering and protecting uh, that amnion. And remember, this is bulging into the lumen here of the uterus. So this would be the fetus, of course. We've got our umbilical cord, our yolk sac, our amniotic cavity right here. And then underneath that, we can see our chorionic villi. And here is something called the decidua basalis. The decidua basalis is, again, just the maternal part of the placenta. And decidua literally means to fall away. So after that baby is delivered, the placenta will be delivered eventually as well. And that's why we use the term decidua. Now, deep to the decidua basalis is probably the myometrium. Remember, the myometrium is the muscular portion of the uterus, which is comprised chiefly of smooth muscle cells. All right, and last but not least, we need to take a look at that miraculous organ of exchange called the placenta. The purpose of the placenta was to exchange nutrients between mom and the baby. Now, the important, important thing to realize about the placenta is it's actually composed both of mom cells as well as the fetus's cells as well. So draw yourself a note right up here. Everything up here is gonna be fetal or embryonic, depending on which stage we are. Everything down here is maternal. So this is the maternal portion of the placenta. This is the embryonic portion or fetal portion of the placenta. What we have up here is we have our chorionic plate. Remember the chorion was derived from the trophoblast. And here we can see our umbilical artery and vein. Umbilical arteries are blue, umbilical veins are red. Yep, that's right. And then we terminate in something called the chorionic villus. The chorionic villus is a sort of tree-like structure and it absorbs nutrients from the mom's blood which is located out here in the intervillous spaces. Now, it's important to realize that ideally, we don't actually have crossing of mom's blood into the chorionic villi because of immunity problems, and we'll talk about that in lecture class. The other important thing to realize is, remember, this chorionic villus is actually derived from the embryo or fetus's tissues. So if we're worried about uh, potential Down syndrome issues uh, with the fetus, we can actually nip off little parts of this chorionic villus before the baby is born, sample them, do a karyotype, and see if that baby's gonna be all right. Okay, other structures we need to point out. Remember, everything down here is primarily maternal. So we, here we have these septa that extend off the decidua. The decidua was the portion of uh, the placenta that is mom's proportion that will eventually be shed. Okay, other things we have down here is we have our umbilical arteries and veins. And you can see the arteries in particular have this spiral formation. And that's important because when we have eventual delivery of that baby, the myometrium, which is located down here, will contract with such ferocity that it will literally shear off these blood vessels and keep them from bleeding out so that we don't have too much blood loss during childbirth. Okay, you've completed the video portion of this developmental biology lab. Be sure that you write down the structures on your worksheets and turn those into Dropbox by one week from now. You also need to complete a knowledge check on Socrative.com. So in order to do that, log on to Socrative.com, log into the student website, and then you want to enter the classroom called DevLab, capital D-E-V-L-A-B. Once you do that, enter your name and then take the quiz. The quiz is about 10 to 20 questions long, and you can take it as many times as you want to verify that you know the structures that will be tested next week on the quiz.